What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel and if you're new here just welcome. My name is Gemma Jade but today we are going to be talking about bizarre disappearances and I didn't know what else to call this video but the disappearances we're going to be talking about today are people that allegedly disappeared into thin air right in front of a witness or witnesses. As far as I could tell, none of these were debunked. If they were, kind of take it with a grain of salt then and move on to the next one. I believe that these are real experiences. If you don't, that's okay. Let me know in the comments, but let's just jump right in. On November 25th, 1809, a diplomat named Benjamin Bathurst was on his way to Berlin to get a train back from London. He was returning to London from a business trip he had gone on in Vienna. On the way though, Bathurst had to stop for food and also new horses. So he made it to the town of Pearlberg where he got off and accomplished these things. Bathurst was traveling with an assistant. So once he was done eating and knew that the horses were going to be ready, he walked on ahead of the assistant and said, I'll meet you at the carriage. I'll wait for you there. The assistant was to go and fetch the horses and then meet Bathurst back at the carriage. However, the assistant was just a few steps behind him as he walked out. Bathurst seemed to be going in the direction of the carriage and then the assistant didn't see him anymore and figured that he would go and fetch the horses, see him back at the carriage. But just a few minutes later, it took him like three to four minutes to go and get the horses who were right there. And when he got back to the carriage, the carriage door was open but the diplomat was completely missing and nowhere to be seen. Now remember, the assistant had seen him going towards the carriage and assumed he had gone there. But not only was there no sign of Benjamin Bathurst, there was no sign of where he might have went. There were no footprints. There, there was nothing. It was open fields for miles and miles, and you could see so far in all directions. It would have been impossible for Bathurst to have kind of just walked and you know walked over a hill and disappeared he obviously did not walk in any one direction because you could see so far completely impossible for him to have been out of sight range in this case because the missing man was a diplomat there was obviously an extremely thorough investigation that was launched pretty much immediately searches of the nearby woods were carried out police went house to house and even had dogs come in to sniff something that had his scent and try to find him, but it was all to no avail. They even dragged the Stepanik River, which was nearby, and they found nothing. In the surrounding woods of the restaurant where he and the assistant had last been eating and where the carriage was, which was found with the door wide open, there was a restroom for hikers and campers. I'm assuming that's what the restroom was for. And in the restroom, there was a coat and in the nearby aforementioned woods, a pair of boots, but neither of which could ever be positively linked to Benjamin Bathurst. So though they found those things, the assistant couldn't say one way or another whether these things belong to Benjamin or not. At the time of this disappearance, the region was war ravaged and ruled by Napoleon. So being a diplomat was dangerous work. And the man's wife, Bathurst's wife, always believed he was kidnapped by the French. But it should be noted here that Napoleon himself always personally denied this. He was asked specifically if he had anything to do with Bathurst's disappearance and he denied it. Bathurst to this day was never seen or heard from again and he seemed to vanish into thin air. There is no definitive evidence which was ever uncovered that led to his whereabouts. Just poof, gone. Believe it or not, it's becoming more and more common these days for people to disappear right in the sight of witnesses. And this is the age of constant surveillance, right? It's not hard to believe that sometimes these things would be captured on camera. However, even back in those times when videos didn't exist, when security cameras didn't exist, people would sometimes vanish right in front of others, like directly in front of their eyes. Here's one of those stories. Just a few years after Benjamin Bathurst's disappearance in 1815, there was a prisoner at the Prussian prison, prison Weichel Mundy, which I know I'm mispronouncing, but I'll put it on the screen, whose name was Derichi. Derichi was in this prison because he had been convicted of assuming the identity of his already deceased landlord. No word on whether or not Derichi had killed the landlord, but I don't think he did. I think the landlord was deceased when Derichi came upon him. 
The identity theft allegedly included him wearing the deceased man's clothes and even his wig in order to go into the bank and withdraw a large sum of money on the pretense that he was this landlord. Diderici was eventually caught and was now serving a 10-year sentence in this Prussian prison. The story goes that as Diderici was being led around the prison yard in his chains one day, it's reported by other prisoners and guards alike that he started to kind of just fade away, just seemed to be erased right out of existence, but slowly. Diderici slowly faded and became transparent until the point his chains and manacles crashed down and clattered to the prison yard ground as there was nothing for them to be attached to anymore. An investigation into the case would obviously be conducted. I mean, a man just randomly disappears from a prison. Obviously, people are thinking that he may have been murdered by guards or another prisoner and there's some kind of cover-up. But no, there were statements from more than 30 witnesses who all stated the exact same thing, that Diderici simply faded out of existence. Witnesses stated, quote, he had become slowly invisible until he wasn't there anymore, end quote. The authorities actually ended up closing the case and how they wrote that they closed it, they put it down as a, quote, an act of God, end quote. And that was their official finding as to what had happened to the prisoner Diderici, an act of God. Maybe it was. No foul play was seemingly happening and nobody ever found a trace of him. I came across a similar case in a place called Leamington Spa in England in 1873. A shoemaker named James Worson was out with his friends one night when, seemingly out of nowhere, he made a bet with his friends that he could run without stopping 16 miles to the ne nearby Coventry. Why he would make this bet, I don't know if this was fun for men back then. You go out drinking and then you know, you make a bet that you can run 16 miles without stopping. I don't know what the heck this was, but that's what he wanted to do. So he, his friends didn't believe that he would be able to go this far without stopping, let alone 16 miles. So they took him up on the little wager and kind of dared him to try to run the 16 miles to the Coventry without stopping. Obviously, they wanted to see how far he could go and also to make sure he wasn't somehow going to be cheating by, you know, hitching a ride or whatever he was thinking. So as Worson ran as fast as he could, his friends very slowly followed in a carriage behind him. Worson ran for quite a few miles, so many, in fact, that his friends were starting to think that they were going to lose the bet because he was going to make it, in their opinion, to the Coventry. Suddenly, with no warning, Worson tripped over something in the road, which was never discovered or determined what he did actually trip over, and he went sprawling forward toward the ground. However, according to all of his friends who were there to witness this event, he never actually hit the ground. See, he went forward as though he were going to hit the ground, as if he were going to just fall flat on his face or perhaps scrape his hands as one would normally do when falling after tripping over something while you're already in a run. But it's said that the second before he should have hit the ground, Worson literally just blinked right out of existence. Despite a thorough search and investigation carried out by the authorities and James's friends and family, nothing ever came of any of it. He blinked out of existence, never to be seen or heard from again. And again, there was no evidence of foul play. Nobody knew what to think. There were multiple witnesses who all said the same thing and kept the same straight story. The witnesses, his friends, said he was simply, quote, here one minute and gone the next, end quote. There are plenty of cases reported throughout history of this strange phenomenon of human beings seemingly disappearing without a trace, blinking out of existence, erasing out of existence by slowly disappearing, either in front of witnesses or not. In the same era as the previous two stories I just recounted to you, there is a rather famous story who happened to a celebrity of the time. The man's name was Lois LaPrince, and he was credited with being the first person to ever capture moving images on film. Quite a contributor to the modern movies and cinema. On September 16th, 1890, he boarded a train to his home in Paris after visiting his brother in Dijon. He was going back to Paris. Le Prince was seen again by many witnesses checking in his luggage and then entering his private cabin. These same witnesses also gave testimony to investigators that they never saw him leave from his train cabin the entire ride back to Paris. He went in and he never came out. 
When they reached their destination, he did not disembark and a porter was sent to the room to find out what was wrong. Obviously just assuming that Le Prince had fallen asleep and, you know, he would just wake him and tell him that they were there. No big deal. However, Le Prince was not in the room and not only was he gone, but his luggage was also gone and neither he nor his luggage was anywhere to be found. During the investigation, they searched the entire train ride to make sure that he didn't jump off or fall off or get pushed off. There was no evidence foul play was afoot. His luggage was never found. He was never found. There was never a single witness who came forward or who was questioned who said that he had left his cabin. It's like he went in and he disappeared and his luggage disappeared as well, which to me is the craziest thing. It's like he took his belongings into his cabin and then vanished into thin air with them. There were no signs of foul play, like I said, and everyone said there was absolutely nothing amiss or abnormal about the train ride. There were no noises coming from his cabin. Some people believe that Thomas Edison had something to do with the disappearance of Le Prince as he was planning on going to America to patent his movie picture machine. A machine which Edison had also been working on for years and Le Prince was just a little bit further ahead of him. No evidence one way or another was found. Let's work our way up to the modern day timeline here and we'll start with the story of Bruce Campbell. In April of 1950, Bruce and his wife were traveling by car from Massachusetts to visit their son who lived all the way across country. I'm not sure which state, but they had a very far way to travel. During this trip, Bruce and his wife decide to stop in Jacksonville, Illinois to rest for the night and get a motel room. When Mrs. Campbell woke the following morning, she saw Bruce was no longer in bed with her and figured he had just gotten up really early. However, she then realized his clothes were still folded where they had been the night before. And this also is when it dawned on her that her husband was nowhere in the room and she became quite panicked because... She knew he would never go out in public in his pajamas, and that's what he had to have done had he left the room. All of his personal belongings, including his wallet with all of his money inside it, were also exactly where he had put them the night before before he laid down to go to bed, and they were completely untouched. There was an intense search and thorough investigation, but Bruce Campbell was never seen or heard from again. And again, no evidence of foul play, no blood, nothing suspicious, just he was there one minute and gone in the next. Whew. Here is the story that always made me think alternate dimension of people just slipping into other dimensions. If you listen to me talk on Fireside Chat, you'll know that I feel sometimes like I slipped a dimension during one of my childhood sicknesses, but that's a whole other story. So similarly, in 1975, a couple named Jackson and Martha Wright were traveling from their home in New Jersey to New York City. According to Jackson, he and his wife were driving through the Lincoln Tunnel when they noticed a large amount of condensation on all of the car's windows. Jackson said that he pulled over and while he attempted to wipe off the front windows, his wife got out and went to the back to wipe off the back windows. He says about a minute or two later, he turns to ask her how she's doing and she was completely gone. He states he had not seen or heard anything unusual up to that point. And it was only a matter of seconds before he had turned to her. Like she got out of the car and it was a second or two before he asked if she was okay and noticed she was missing. There were no other cars that could have hit her. Obviously he would have seen her get hit by a car. There's nowhere she could have went. He called her name and even tried looking inside of and under the vehicle, but to no avail. By now you know the story, vanished without a trace and seeming in, seemingly into nowhere without any provocation or idea as to what could have happened. Some people think this one is kind of suspicious, but there were witnesses in the small amount of cars that were driving by. And while no one saw her blink out of existence, nobody saw anything else strange either. Could she have not been in the car? Could he? I mean, we can get into all kinds of ideas or possibilities as to what could have happened. But this is allegedly a disappeared without a trace story. And it's one that always stuck with me because it reminds me of I just get the feeling somehow that Jackson's wife switched dimensions. There was some kind of glitch in the matrix that, which by the way, I am currently scripting a video about matrix glitches. So stay tuned for that. Moving on. In even more recent years, there are still more and more cases popping up despite, as I said before, the age of surveillance we're living in. Same story, different decade. Let's start with Brandon Swanson. On May 14th, 2008, 19-year-old college student Brandon Swanson was on his way to visit his family in Marshall, Wisconsin, when he suddenly lost control of his vehicle and crashed into a ditch. 
He wasn't injured at all, but his car was completely totaled, so he had lost the ability to drive it. He was close enough that he could call his parents for a ride, and they readily agreed without a problem to go and pick him up. He gave them some details about which exit he was at and the surrounding areas, and his parents went on their way expecting to do a small, you know, half-hour drive and pick their son up. They ended up calling Brandon back, however, because though they followed his instructions exactly, they weren't able to find him, and his dad was asking him for more and more details. And this is when Brandon told his father that he was headed toward a town called Lind. As they were still talking, Brandon reportedly cursed. He either said the F word or, quote, oh shit, end quote. And then the line went dead. So he cursed and the line went completely dead. His parents tried over and over again to call him back, but it would just go to voicemail. They never got any answer, so they decided to call the authorities. Though Brandon's car was eventually found, by the way, nowhere near Lind, he also wasn't where he originally said that he was, and in fact was miles and miles his car was found away from there. He was never seen or heard from again. It's unknown what happened to him, and also, why did he curse right before his phone went dead? That is not... I can do a whole video and list like 8 or 10 random disappearances of people who seemingly vanished without a trace that made a phone call before they died and cursed or said something like, oh my God, or something like that. And then the phone died and they were never seen or heard from again. And the phone never picked up again. So, and usually in these cases, I can go even further of things that I've researched and tell you that in these cases, a lot of the time, if the phone is found, it was smashed. Don't even get me started on Brandon Lawson. On April Fool's Day, which is April 1st, in 2006, a medical student from Ohio State University named Brian Schaefer, I know most of us know this one, but I, how could I not include poor Brian? He went out with some friends for drinks at a bar called the Ugly Tuna Saluna. As the night wore on, Brian and his friends drank more and more, and by the end of the night, Brian was reportedly highly intoxicated. Between 1.30 and 2 a.m., Brian drunk dialed his girlfriend. I don't know what the conversation entailed or if he even got a hold of her or left a message. But after this drunk dial, he was seen outside of the bar talking to two women on the surveillance footage. But it's important to note here that the bar was in some kind of building where you have to take the escalator up from the main entrance to get to this bar. So though he was outside the bar talking to these women, he was actually still inside the building. He would have had to take the escalators down. There were no other entrances or exits to this bar except for one small construction area, which was, I believe, covered by video surveillance. This is an important fact to note because as the night wound down and Brian's friends looked for him to leave, he was nowhere to be found. In fact, when he was seen speaking to the women in front of the bar was the last time anyone, including any kind of security or surveillance cameras, had seen him. That's the last time he was seen on the property. He was never seen leaving the bar though either. He was never seen or heard from again. And to this day, his whereabouts and what happened to him are unknown. There was absolutely no evidence of foul play ever found during many subsequent investigations, and it's still considered an unsolved disappearance. There's other tragic things connected to Brian Schaefer. Again, I can do a whole video just on his story, on any one of these stories, really. This one definitely had enough information, but I think everyone's familiar with it. If you're not familiar with Brian Schaefer and you want to hear his story in like a threefer like when I do like three separate stories of random disappearances Brandon Lawson things like that let me know another more recent case of someone seemingly here one minute and gone the next as they just walked right off the face of the earth allegedly in front of a witness took place on July 18th 2007 when a woman named Barbara Bullock and her male friend Jim Ramaker were hiking in the Bitterroot Mountains in Montana in the United States Jim holds firm that Barbara was only walking 20 to 30 feet behind him the entire hike. And he would randomly turn and look at her while they were walking because they were having a conversation about the scenery, about the hike, just about life in general. And they were taking a very slow, scenic hike. They weren't in any kind of rush. According to Ramaker, it was during one of these frequent stops made to admire the scenery in front of them when Barbara was there one minute and when he turned for just a split second and back again, she was gone. No trace of her at all. Barbara was never found, nor was there any trace of her, and Jim Ramaker was cleared almost immediately as police could think of no motive for why he would want to get rid of her or done any harm to her. 
Plus, again, there was never ever any evidence of foul play at all. And like the others on the list, she was very simply there one minute and gone the next. Can you imagine being the witness to this? I mean, the Lord only knows what happens to the victims, to the people who disappear. But can you imagine being a witness to this? How devastating that would be and how suspicious and suspect and shady you'd be. And you might even go to prison for the rest of your life or be on death row. If some coincidental, you know, speck of blood or something happened where it might look like foul play. I mean, I would be terrified something like this is going to happen to someone I love while I'm standing right there. Not just for losing my loved one and thinking for the rest of my life, where did they go? But for the fact that could I possibly be blamed for this? I mean, it's scary all the way around. Think about it. While the people on this list were never seen or heard from again, it's important to note that this isn't always the case. The fact that many people who had seemingly disappeared without a trace do in fact come back, but for one reason or another, it's never known what happened to them during their time away or gone. They're almost always found unconscious or semi-conscious and unable to speak or remember, or if they are found just fine, they're children who aren't old enough to speak or they have some kind of disability for whatever reason, which prevents them from speaking about what happened. So we still don't know what happened. Every once in a while, someone will remember detailed information about where they'd gone or what had happened to them. And most of the time, they don't ever want to talk about it and they spend the rest of their lives without talking about it. There's usually some kind of deathbed confession sometimes. But when they do remember and they do decide to talk about it, the facts are always so bizarre and downright unbelievable that it lends no clarity or credibility to the situation and makes things even more confusing and difficult to try and piece together and understand. There's been talk of abductions and kidnappings, kind of like a human element to all of this, or at least most of these vanishings. But to those of you who subscribe to these theories, I ask you this. How in the world could a human being be so quick as to abduct a person in full view of another person or group of other people in a matter of the blink of an eye and not only not be seen, but also they're able to somehow do this without ever leaving any evidence behind at all or getting any kind of resistance from the victim? To me, personally, suggesting a human element makes no sense because humans are not perfect and make mistakes. Even if just one person who we spoke about in this video was in fact kidnapped for whatever reason, I still have a hard time believing the person doing the abducting could be so efficient, efficient, let alone in every single case that ever happens. I guess some can say that some of these stories are so old that maybe things have been exaggerated and or flat out made up for the sake of dramatic effect. Maybe the details have been made more interesting or more fantastical or even more scarce as the stories got, got to be retold, right? The more you retell it, it's like a game of what do you call it? Chinese telephone or some people call it just the telephone game, right? By the time you get to the end of it, what the original person said is a mess. Is this possible? Sure. Is it very likely? Probably. But again, over-dramatizing for dramatic effect can only be the reasoning for so many of these cases. It can't possibly be the reason for every single one of them. Just like human abduction, a human element cannot be the answer to all of these happenings. There are some I believe in more than others, but I think even the ones which are almost obviously made up to some are the most believable ones to others as well. This is all about our own beliefs and even our own experiences, as I say all the time on this channel. These are the things which help us to choose what we believe in. And I have to say, I don't even have a healthy skepticism for most of the stories that I just told you. I believe pretty much 100% in all of them. I've personally encountered, seen, heard, researched, figured out, uncovered way too much. And for me, the unknown is becoming more and more common and never getting any answers is becoming more and more acceptable, honestly, with all of the research that I do, which kind of sucks because, I mean, I want answers just as much as the next person, but they're just not available in a lot of these cases. And that's what makes it so incredibly interesting to people. It's a phenomenon now. It's all some channels even talk about. Despite what you all believe in, I hope that you found this short and kind of to the point, quirky little video entertaining. At most, I hope it makes you think and want to learn more and research more. And please send me your encounters of anything strange and bizarre to my email. I know many of you already did, but I got to tell you I ran out of space. So people were telling me they were sending me things, but then I wasn't getting them because I had to buy more space, which I finally did. And then 
I would get the list of listener stories together and then I would forget about them and not know where I put them. So if you want your story told, whether you told it to me or not already, if you haven't emailed it to me within the past two weeks to a month, even if it was five months ago, guys, that's how behind I am. I'm really sorry. I've been letting my emails just go, like pretending like they don't even exist. So if you want, if you wouldn't mind just re-emailing it to me and just resend it, I would really appreciate it so I can put out the listener stories that I've been promising for months now. I'm trying to get back on the ball. I got very overwhelmed for a little while there with everything I was doing, but I kind of found my system now. I kind of found my groove, if you will. So guys, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up comment let me know what you think let me know what you think of these stories let me know about your experiences send it to email gemmajadeyt at gmail.com please share i'm still trying to get that subscriber count up be sure to like my views far surpass my likes and that's kind of you know something that i would like to change i'd like to get the thumbs up to be at least a little bit closer to equal with all of the views i know that it's never like an equal amount so anyway please be sure and check out the description box. I will leave two ways to financially support the channel through my Patreon and my PayPal. You can click on either one of those to make either a one-time or a monthly recurring donation. Every little bit helps. Everything is appreciated. I'm also going to leave links to the three live streams Steve Stockton and I do, which is Real Evil on DeZombified's channel, Fireside Chat on Missing Persons and Mysteries, and Campfire Tales on Missing Persons and Mysteries. And I'm sure most of you by now know what those are. And if you don't, go down and click on them. Click on them anyway. Like over there. Leave a comment. Let us know what you think. And I'll also leave a link for mine and Steve's podcast, which we haven't worked on in months because we've been so busy doing everything else. We're hoping to bring it back soon after we start and finish the Caleb Smith Justice for Caleb Smith podcast, which we're hoping to be starting within the next two to three weeks. Click on the links, show us some love. If you're able to financially support the channel, I would appreciate if you do so. Be kind to each other. It doesn't cost anything, can make you feel so good. Let your kindness show because it's beautiful, I promise. Have your best day, have your best night, and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.